You know those moments when nature seems both terrifying and miraculous? A rattlesnake strike, a deadly jellyfish sting, a bite from a cobra that can collapse lungs faster than you can scream. For centuries, human beings confronted these horrors with fear and folklore. Then something remarkable happened. We started turning poison into cure. See it right here on History of Simple Things. Long before modern medicine, venomous bites were often death sentences. A fanged animal's toxin didn't just hurt, it hijacked your nervous system, shredded tissue, or stopped your heart. People tried everything, sucking at wounds, cutting them open, applying herbs, chants, charms, you name it. Some of the earliest scientific observations about venom weren't even medical. In the 18th century, scientists noticed something curious. Snakes don't die from their own venom. They're immune. Felice Fontana wrote about it in 1767. And soon after, explorers like Patrick Russell recorded similar natural immunity in snakes. That raised a question. Could immunity to venom be turned into a treatment for people? By the late 19th century, researchers began experimenting with that idea. This wasn't pop science. It was the birth of a whole new way to think about disease, using the body's own defenses as medicine. Enter Albert Calmet, not a Hollywood villain, though the name sounds dramatic enough. Calmet was a French physician working at the Pasteur Institute. He wasn't initially looking for snakebite cures. His background was in immunology, the same science behind vaccines for rabies and diphtheria. But in the early 1890s, while stationed in what is now Vietnam, Calmet saw the toll that cobra bites were taking. Mortality was high. Treatment options were nearly non-existent. He applied the same logic that Louis Pasteur used to develop vaccines. Introduce a small amount of a harmful agent so the body learns to fight it. Calmet injected small, non-lethal doses of cobra venom into animals, especially horses. Over time, the animal's immune system produced antibodies, microscopic proteins designed to bind to and neutralize the venom's toxic components. The breakthrough? Those antibodies could be harvested draw the animal's blood, separate the plasma, extract the antibody fraction, and boom, you have something that can be injected into a human being to counteract venom already circulating in their body. That was the origin of what we now call antivenom, a therapy made not from magic, but from the immune response of an animal trained to tolerate venom. Let's break down the process into something you can imagine in your head, step by step. Step one. Venom collection. First, you need venom. Skilled handlers capture venomous snakes or other creatures and milk them, a controlled process where venom is coaxed out of the fangs into a sterile container. This venom is rich in the very toxins that make bites dangerous. Step two, venom preparation. The collected venom is analyzed and mixed. Often venom from several specimens is pooled, so the final antivenom will be effective against variations in venom within a species, or even against several species in polyvalent antivenoms. Step three, immunizing the animal. Now for the biological trick, the venom mixture is injected in tiny, carefully controlled doses into a large animal, most commonly a horse or sometimes a sheep. These animals are chosen because their large size and robust immune systems can handle gradual exposure and produce lots of antibodies without being killed. Over weeks and months, the doses increase. The animal's immune system responds by manufacturing antibodies, tailor-made proteins that latch onto venom molecules and render them harmless. Step four, harvesting the antibodies. Once the animal has generated enough antibodies, blood is drawn. The plasma, the liquid part of the blood that contains those valuable antibodies, is separated and pooled. Step five, purification. This is where real pharmaceutical craft comes in. The antibody-rich plasma isn't safe to inject as is. It must be purified and processed to isolate just the immunoglobulin fragments that will neutralize venom. That purification step often involves filtering out proteins that could trigger allergic reactions in humans. Step six, testing and quality control. Every batch undergoes rigorous checks, potency assays, safety evaluations, and sterility tests before it gets labeled, 
packaged and shipped to hospitals and clinics where it may save lives. At its core, anti-venom is antibody therapy. Those antibodies act like venom catchers. Once injected into a bitten person, they find and bind the venom molecules, neutralizing their harmful actions so the patient's own body can recover. The reason this method has endured for more than a century isn't tradition, it's efficacy. Before anti-venom, fatal snake bites were common. Now, when the right anti-venom is available and administered quickly, most victims survive. That alone made this therapy a global standard. Beyond medicine, anti-venom has become part of public health policy. Organizations like the World Health Organization classify snake bite envenoming as a major neglected tropical disease. Anti-venoms are on the Wojo's list of essential medicines. That's not symbolic. It's a recognition that without these serums, death and disability rates in regions with venomous fauna would soar. The classic method stuck because it works and because nothing dramatically better came along for decades. We perfected purification, improved safety, and expanded species coverage, but the core logic, train an animal's immune system to do the work we couldn't do fast enough ourselves, remained the same. Here's where the story gets interesting. The traditional animal-derived approach isn't perfect. One issue is specificity. Anti-venom made for one species doesn't always work for another. That's because venom chemistry varies wildly across species. A cobra bite and a rattlesnake bite are molecularly different problems. Another problem is side effects. Injecting animal-derived antibodies into humans can sometimes trigger immune reactions. Doctors now use purification techniques to minimize this, but it's still a concern. And then there's supply. Producing anti-venom is labor-intensive and expensive. Some regions of the world, especially low-income rural areas where snake bites are most common, face shortages. Scientists aren't just standing still. New research aims for broader-spectrum treatments, including nanobody-based therapies against multiple snake species and even prototypes inspired by human donors who developed broad immunity. These approaches could eventually reduce reliance on animal serum and expand coverage. When you think about it, anti-venom is a story about learning from nature and turning evolution's weapons into shields. We took venom, a molecule evolved to disable life, and learned how to neutralize it reliably. It's also a lesson in humility. As powerful as anti-venom is, its effectiveness depends on timing, accuracy, and access. If you're bitten and the right anti-venom isn't available, the best cure on paper can't save you. Anti-venom didn't come from a single aha moment. It emerged from centuries of observation, experimentation, and refinement. From the Pasteur Institute in Lille to modern production labs around the world, the journey from fangs to serum bottles has been one of biology meeting ingenuity. Thank you for watching. If you have suggestions for our next video, feel free to share them in the comments below. We'll be sure to give you an acknowledgement for your contribution. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other bingeable channels. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the history of simple things. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more stories woven through the smallest details.